Let's talk about what's new in Apache Spark 4, the latest version as of this recording. Lots going on, and as usual, Apache Spark kind of waits for new features to accumulate before they say, well, maybe it's time for a new major version update. Uh, the, the major version updates themselves generally don't have a ton of huge new features, but they do represent a large evolution from the previous beginning of the previous major version. So let's talk about some of the newer features in Spark. Some of this might not make sense to you right away if you're brand new to Spark, but uh, just to get it in your head, some of the latest and greatest capabilities, we'll, we'll start with that. So some of the bigger changes that, that are normally attributed to Spark 4 actually came out in Spark 3.5, which is probably going to be the last version of Spark 3 to come out before we switch to Spark 4. And uh, one of those is Spark Connect. So this is a big change in where Spark is now available in a client server ar architecture. So it used to be that you would run your Spark driver scripts on a computer in your cloud, and then that computer in the cloud would talk to other computers in the cloud, but it was all done remotely on this uh, self-contained cluster, if you will. With Spark Connect, you can actually control your remote cluster, well, remotely. So you can actually run a Spark driver script on your desktop or wherever you might want it to be. Um, and control a larger cluster that's somewhere else. So that's a big deal. Now, later on in this course, we have an entire lecture on Spark Connect and an example of using it hands-on. So stay tuned for that if you want more details on Spark Connect. That's a big deal. Also, they've expanded SQL functionality in Spark 3.5, including what they call user-defined table functions. Again, we have a whole lecture on that and a hands-on activity as well later on, so we'll go into much more depth. The high level, though, is that it's a way of, from Spark SQL, actually expanding rows into multiple rows and extracting multiple rows of information from one. So that's kind of a new thing. Also, they have Apache Arrow optimized UDF. So UDF is a user-defined function within SQL. So this makes it much more efficient to have your own custom processing logic embedded in your SQL commands within Apache Spark for distributing your, your processing across a cluster. They've also greatly expanded the number of SQL functions available in the Spark Data Frame API. Over 150 have been added in Spark 3.5, so that's pretty cool. Also, uh, jumping on the AI bandwagon, there's now an English SDK for Apache Spark. That's what you see in this example here on the right there, where now instead of writing code, you can just say in plain English, what do you want to do? So I can say on a data frame object in Apache Spark, what are the best selling and second best selling products in every category? And it will go off and figure that out for you as part of the English SDK for Apache Spark. Is that the future? I don't know. You know, sometimes you want to be able to specify things more concretely by actually writing code. But if you want to get up and going quick and dirty just with the uh, plain English commands, now you can do that as well. Again, introduced in 3.5, not necessarily 4.0, but very big deal. They've also added a bunch of new debugging features in 3.5, including enhanced error messaging and also a new testing API with some tools for testing equality between data frames that might come into handy. Those enhanced error messages are also useful. They give you much more detail about what went wrong and point to specific lines within your code as to where that problem happened. Previously, debugging Spark applications was a little bit tricky, and it's gotten a lot easier now with Spark 3.5. They also introduced a Deep Speed distributor. Deep Speed is a, uh, a training system for PyTorch modules. So if you're doing machine learning and you want to use the Apache Sparks architecture for distributing that training, they have something called the Deep Speed distributor introduced in 3.5 that can help you integrate Spark into your machine learning pipeline. All right, those are some of the major features introduced in 3.5 that kind of inspired them to say, eh, maybe it's time to call it 4.0. But in 4.0, there are also some new features that did not exist in Spark 3 at all. One of those is turning on ANSI mode by default, and we're talking about ANSI SQL compliance here. Now, it used to be that certain errors in SQL commands within Apache Spark would just quietly succeed. You know, they just insert null values into your results that you might not have expected. But with ANSI compliance in effect, that will actually generate and throw an error, so you're forced to correct that error and you know, not have any surprises about missing or invalid data later on. So if you had an invalid cast before or divide by zero or something like that, um, you will actually get an error for that in this case now. Also, missing data can trigger errors now as well. So for example, if you have an operation in your SQL for Apache Spark that says add 100 to this uh, column where I assume there's a number, and in fact you had missing data in there, in Spark 3 that would be okay. It would just give you a null result. But in Spark 4 we'll say, ah, no, that's invalid. I'm gonna throw an error. So it is, it's much more strict now. So to make that concrete, here's a couple of examples. Let's say I had a uh, select statement that I'm using in the SQL interface for Apache Spark, and I said select cast some string as float. Obviously that's invalid, right? You know, I'm, I can't cast a string to a float value, not, 
Well, that doesn't really make sense. In Spark 3, that would re just return a null value, and it would just proceed on its merry way with a null value there as a result of that operation. But in Spark 4, it would actually throw an error and say, ah, I can't do that. I can't cast a string to a float. I'm going to stop you right there. All right. Now, if you do need backward compatibility, you can do that. There is a config option you can set on Spark now. Just say spark.sql.ansi.enable to false, and that will disable ANSI compliance if your existing scripts can't operate with that new behavior. Also in Spark 4, they've introduced the variant data type. This is a new thing. And this is made for better support of semi-structured data. Like we have a lot of unstructured data these days in your data lakes from JSON sources or XML sources and whatnot. This makes it easier to wrangle that data within Apache Spark. So there's now a get JSON object function that you can use to extract various data from your JSON blobs. Little example here on the right. So you can see that we have a variant column that we're defining here that contains a, uh, you know, JSON style data. You know, we have the structured data where we have some sort of an ID, one, two, three, followed by within curly brackets, just random stuff, right? That has random labels. So this is the kind of unstructured data that you might expect in a data lake. Now using the variant data type, I can see that down there at the bottom that I can extract that by just saying, get JSON object on that uh, result and extract the specific uh, bits of that data that I'm interested in. So this makes it a little bit easier to deal with that unstructured JSON data within Apache Spark, also new in Spark 4. Also new in Spark 4 is collation support. What is that? So it's about uh, string handling and supporting uh, different sorting and comparison operations in things that might be compared in different ways. So string data is messy, right? It can be from different languages. It can be encoded in different ways. Maybe you want it to be case insensitive. Maybe you don't. Maybe you want to ignore accents. Maybe you don't. With the collation support in Spark 4, you can define just how strict you want to be in your string comparisons. There's a couple of ways of doing that. You can bake that into the table definition itself, and that's what you're seeing in the example at the top here. We're saying, as we're creating our table, I explicitly want to take the name column, which is a string type, and say that the collate on that is going to be Unicode CIAI. So I'm going to be comparing those name values as Unicode strings, but I'm going to ignore case sensitivity and accent sensitivity in the process. So no matter what the capitalization is, no matter what the accents are, it will consider those to be the same string when I'm doing comparisons. Also, you can do it just within your select statements at, uh, at runtime. So I could also say as part of a select statement, I want to select that name value, that string, and when I'm doing my order by, when I'm sorting it, I want to specifically say that I'm going to, again, ignore capitalization and accents by specifying the Unicode CI AI collate option there, also new in Spark 4. And uh, you can also specify that at the session level too. So as you're creating your session for using Apache Spark, you can just set that as an option for what you want that default behavior to be within your session. Another new feature in Spark 4 is data source APIs in Python. And this is just a better way of uh, making your own custom data sources. Later in this course, we have a lot of examples of using Spark streaming, and we have to kind of jump through some hoops to fabricate these sort of test streams of data to play around with. With data source APIs, that's going to be a lot easier because all we have to do is uh, create our own custom data source and we can write our own custom data syncs as well. So this gives us a lot more flexibility about where your data is coming from and where it's going to. You just have to subclass a data source base class and fill in the blanks as to how that actually accesses its data. There's a little example here on the right here. Uh, not important to go into the details of it right now. Um, once that's re released to general availability, we'll have an example for that later in the course. But the takeaway is that with custom data source APIs, you can now make it easier to generate these mock fake streams for testing data or for just connecting to arbitrary data sources and arbitrary places where you want to write your data to. So this gives you a lot more flexibility in Spark as to managing your data. Uh, this used to exist uh, outside of Python. The new thing in Spark 4 is that there's now a Python API for this as well. And more broadly, a few more uh, features down the laundry list of what's new in Spark 4. At a high level, they're really starting to let go of the old RDD interface that they started with back in Spark 1. That's not a big surprise. And as such, uh, we are starting this course with that old RDD interface because, you know, you might still need to know that for supporting legacy code or just for understanding the history of Spark and sort of its underpinnings at a lower level. I think it's still worth knowing, but um, I will say that as you get into the RDD portion of this course, which is going to start a couple of lectures from now, you can get away with skipping that part and just jumping straight to data frames because data frames are the future for sure. Um, it's been that way for a while since Spark 2, really. So consider that RDD section optional. That's cool. I won't, uh, I won't judge you if you skip those lessons. It's okay. And 
more relevant to Spark 4, Spark Connect does not support the RDD interface at all. So if you're gonna be using that new client server system in Spark 4, RDDs aren't even an option. So they are on the way out. Uh, data frames are where it's at. We'll talk about what that is in a few lectures. Also, uh, Java 17 is going to be the default Java version for use with Spark 4, and they'll presumably keep getting that updated. And uh, as of right now, with the Spark 4 preview release that I'm working with, Preview 2, uh, they still don't support the latest version of Python 3.12, but, but I have seen some chatter in the Spark 4 development uh, board saying that they are going to be adding that. So you can watch for the latest and greatest Python and Java versions being supported in Spark 4 for sure. Right now, that's not the case with Spark 3. We did have to take care to actually install an older version of Python and an older version of Java, as you might recall, with Spark 3, which is, well, annoying. Also, uh, Delta Lake 4 support is rolled into Spark 4. And also, I've noticed that there's been some changes in the Windows support for Spark. It's always kind of been an afterthought, Windows uh, support with Apache Spark. But since that's what most of you probably have at home, that's what I've uh, focused on installing here. Spark does really depend on Hadoop these days. And uh, if you're using this on Windows, used to be you could usually get away with not having sort of a fake boilerplate Hadoop system on your Windows system. That's no longer the case with Spark 4. Not only do you need a winutils.exe application file, you also need a hadoop.dll file. But you already installed that, right, in the setup lecture here. Uh, but that is necessary now, where it wasn't always necessary in Spark 3. But that's back. It's going to be using Hadoop for a lot of file I.O. on your local system. Uh, so you do need that system in place. So that's the news with Spark 4. And uh, let's jump into the basics of Apache Spark next and start getting our feet wet.